my wife as well, you know, uh, the, thank you for all the endless texts to encourage my wife to pray for her. And I'm glad she is discharged from the hospital. And all glory to the Lord, you know, because of all your prayer and our Lord heard the prayer. Okay, good. That's on behalf of my family, you know, and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord, this morning as we come to this passage of Scripture. It's so relevant for all of us because we are living the time, Lord, we see darkness is around. We see evil, Lord, multiplying, Lord, twofold and threefold. And this is telling us, the Father, Lord, that this is a tough time and difficult time. And we are living in that time. It's so relevant to the passage that God has spoken to us, Lord, this morning through your word. And I pray, O oh Father, Lord, that this morning as you speak, Lord, I ask that you will open our eyes to see, our ears to listen, and our hearts, Lord, to be receptive to your word. So that, Father, that we will hear and not only hear, but we also apply the truth as well. And so, Father, we commit this time to hand. And this, Father, we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the word compromise. The word compromise is a very, has a different meaning for different people. Because some of us hear this word compromise, you know, they find that, oh, it's very soothing. And some people, when they hear this word compromise, they feel very disturbed. To some, the word compromise sounds like a good solution. But to others, it is a deadly one because it can end with a very disastrous consequence in our life. When we apply that to a relational conflict management, now that is good because it is a give and take situation. Huh? You take some, you know, and I give some, you give some, and I take some, and it sounds like a solution. And it allows room for us to breathe and also give us time to grow. So compromise sounds like a good word. But then, when it comes to a compromise of conviction of what is good and what is evil, what is sinful and what is holiness, then compromise becomes deadly. It is a sure but a slow death. But it will happen. It's the sure and a slow death. There's a Russian parable. I don't know whether you have heard about this parable. It's a parable to talk about the bear and the hunter. And it says that there was a hunter, you know, who was out, you know, hunting, and he raised his rifle, aiming carefully at a large hungry bear that was out in the forest hunting for food. And when the hunter was about to pull the trigger, the bear suddenly spotted the hunter. And then the bear spoke, you know, with a soft, soothing voice. And this is why I say, hold on. Isn't it better to talk than to shoot? What do you want? Let us negotiate the matter. And so the hunter lowered his rifle. And then the hunter said to the bear, I just want a warm fur coat. And the best is good. That sounds good. I think we can negotiate on that. I only want to have a full stomach. So let us negotiate a compromise. And so both of them sat down and they negotiated. And after the while, the bear happily walked away with a full stomach all by himself. Now that negotiation was successful, very successful. Why? Because both sides also benefited, right? The bear has a full stomach and the hunter has a warm coat covering over him inside the stomach. And this parable reminds us that not all compromise end with equal measure. Because compromise rarely satisfies both sides in equal measures. And this morning, we have gone through the Bible 
we had gone to the first church, we talked about church in Ephesus that was uh, orthodox, uh, a church, you know, that is active, a church that is wise, and yet Jesus condemned the church and said the church has lacked or lost his first love for God. And then he went on and talked about our church assaulted, poverty striking, the church of Smyrna, they suffer greatly under great persecution, and yet this church remained faithful to the Lord. And this morning, we're coming to a third church, a church that Jesus addressed in Pergamon. In Pergamon. A church that compromises his convictions and lead to the ineffectiveness to witness for Christ. Now, you must understand that Pergamon was actually located in a city. A city actually referring to be with this name called a dwelling place of Satan. Now, we hear the phrase, the dwelling place of Satan. Now, needless to say anything further, I would say, it was an extremely tough and difficult city for Christians to live in and to minister in. Because... That place is the dwelling place of Satan, the devil himself. But unfortunately, the believers in Pergamum did not rise, did not rise to the occasions and shine brightly for the Lord Jesus Christ. But the believers in Pergamum allowed their witness to diminish to a mere flicker, like a candle about to blow off. They were supposed to shine, but it now become a mere flicker. Now, how did that happen? How can the church, the voice of city, you know, and then did he diminish to that extent? How? By compromising their godly standard with the godlessness of the culture of the day. And that's what happened. And like many of us, they are now living in a very difficult time, you know, we know that the devil is working very hard. We all know it. And just like the believers in Pergamon, they fell prey to one of Satan's most devious methods of rendering God's people spiritually ineffective by compromising. And knowing that this church has been making the compromise with the devil and the evil, Christ actually now sent them a personal letter directly to confront this church about the compromise and indirectly to warn each one of us and alert us that this same danger can happen to all of us. Now let's remain open with our eyes and our heart to this piercing word of God concerning the danger of spiritual compromise in this church. And this passage actually begins with a description of the author himself. And this author, I say, is Jesus, you know. But this time, he used the word to describe him as a judge. And to this church, Christ is going to be a judge and he's going to judge this church. And he said to, this angel of, uh, to the angel of the church in Pergamon, right? These are the word of him who has the sharp double ages sword. Now, as with all the other letters that Jesus has written in Revelation 2 to 3, uh, the letter to this church of Pergamon was actually again addressed to the elders, to the pastors, and the leaders of this church. And asked them to take note. As leaders, take note of this and tell your member. However, the one who dictated this letter, this third letter, this time described himself that he is the one, different from the first two letters. In the first two letters, God is a different word to describe himself. But here, he described himself as the one, the one which is called the sharp double-edged sword. And the imagery of this word, the double-edged sword, probably has a double reference or meaning. It can be translated theologically or it can be translated culturally. 
according to Hebrew chapter 4, verse 12, this is what the scriptures says about the I don't have that. Yeah, it's up there in Hebrew chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. And it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Now, the emphasis on this double-edged sharpness probably, first of all, here indicate the scriptural ability. That the Word of God has the ability to judge not only the thoughts, but also the intent. Now, this cannot be seen by outside, by other people, but God can see our thoughts, hear our thoughts, and judge our heart, our intention, but the Word of God can do that. It is God's written standard of perfection. And consequently, because it is written by God, it has a capacity to differentiate between truth and error. It has a capacity to differentiate between right from wrong, regardless how foggy the situation may be or the issue is this, but the Word of God can judge and differentiate. Doctrinally, God wanted each one to know that God knows what is happening in our heart. And culturally, when we talk about this sword as a double-edged sword, it also has another meaning. The sword is always used as, you know, as a power, you know, the rule, you know, the king will raise the sword, you know, I have the sword, you know, so I have authority, it talks about the authority, and not about authority, the person who makes rule and law and says the judge. So, culturally, the sword has a different meaning. Let's take a look at this, culturally. Culturally, the sword imagery may be communicating judgment. God is going to judge. And just like Pergamon, a city that was given the power of the sword, huh? you mean to rule Christ's power over life and death, is also the sword. He is going to judge. But unlike Pergamon, Pergamon, Jesus' authority is ultimate, final. Human authority is not final, but Jesus' authority is final because it's not granted by Rome. Neither is it limited by the civil boundary huh, that is governed by the Roman Empire. His legal right to judge is inherent because he is God. And because he is God, he can judge. And coming out of his mouth, who make the heaven and the earth? Let it be light and let it be light. You know, let it have this and this and everything happen. That the word of God has authority and power. Not only that, that his authority is universal. Why? The day will come where everyone will have to bow before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And every knee will bow before him and everyone will face his judgment. He is the ultimate judge. And from the descriptions of the judge, both you know, theologically and also culturally, Jesus now moved on to tell us the condition of this church of Pergamum. Why he speak against this church. Let's look at the condition of the church of Pergamum. Now, Christ's letter to the believers in Pergamum here continue. First, with words of praise. He begins by praising this church. You know, and then he ends with some words of criticism about this church, some condemnation. Let's take a look at this full passage here. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. And yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Nevertheless, he says, I have a few things against you. There are some among you, some among you, not all, who holds on to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they add food sacrifice to idols and commit sexual morality. And likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of Nicolaitans. Now, first of all, let's begin with what Jesus commends 
about these believers in this place of Pergamon. Jesus first described these Pergamon believers that Jesus knew the city that they are living in. He says what? That city is where Satan has his throne. I imagine. That's where the center of rule, the control. Uh, and he have the maximum power in that city. Now to understand what Jesus is saying about that, we need some background and information about this place for Pergamum in order for us to understand why he said that that place is where Satan has his throne here. Now the city was actually seated on the hill. On the hill. I don't know what kind of map there to show us. Let me see. Yeah, this is a picture. The city is actually sitting on a hill about 1,000 feet, looking down about 18 miles, no, 18 miles into the Aegean Sea. You can see the sea down there, and it's a flat valley up to the hill down there. You know? And it was, there was a river flowing called the Caicos River that actually provided all the trade, the nourishment, or whatever daily necessity needed. And also there was also a trade road running through the city into the interior, into Asia Minor. Now, you will stand on top of the hill there and look down. Can you see how important the place is? Very important place. This city was known for its magnificent architecture. Beautiful building. Not only that, they have a great library. And this library is second to the most famous library in Alexandria. Huh? That in Egypt. That's how it looked like. But then Pergamum was most renowned not because of the economic location and not because of the culture, but that place was famous because of the flourishing center of pagan worship. What I mean by pagan worship? In BC 29, Pergamum had applied to Rome to build a temple. And they were given a permission to build a temple that is dedicated to worship a living person. And that person is the emperor, the emperor of Rome. And so we did a short period of time, they built three temples. Three temples for three different emperors to worship them. Now, can you imagine what that place is like? Human can be like God. And beside that, let's go back a little, you know, tell us a little bit more about this place. Not only that, that place, there were also other uh, uh, idols you know, or deity that they worship, including the Greek, you know, uh, god of Zeus, Antena, you know, Dionysus, and also the Eclipios. And the worship in this city, in Pergamum as well. Besides worshiping human, they worship all these Greek gods. And every of these beings have their own temple, laboriously decorated, not decorated, ornately sculptured. And in fact, Zeus' temple was one of the seven wonders of the world. You can see the picture of Zeus' temple, the old picture of it is called the throne of Satan. Why? Because the structure was built in such a way it looked like a seat, a throne where you rest your two arms. And when German went over there in Pergamon and saw this structure, this beautiful wonder, they actually dismantled the whole temple piece by piece and then took it back to Germany in Berlin and reconstructed it. And the one in the center called the Altar of Zeus is the original temple of Zeus. It is now in Berlin. One of the seven wonders. Can you imagine this city worshipping? No wonder Hitler want to have that throne. No wonder Hitler want to have that whole building brought over back you know, into Germany and become so catastrophic in World War II. And so there's little doubt that this city, Pergamon, saturated with idolatry, led Christ to actually refer to this city as the throne of Satan's influence. And perhaps, 
Another God, the God of Beckerman, which they worship, the best exemplifies Jesus' command was this God of Eclipius. Let's take a look at this. These are all the God that they have. You know, the worship, and especially this one called Eclipius. Now, Eclipius is actually you know, uh, worship in Beckerman, and they will call him the Savior because he has the power to heal. And it is marked by a serpent. This coin round, you see there's a rod he's holding to. Uh, and that symbol of Satan would have readily actually reminded the Christian that their greatest adversary enemy is Satan himself. And his worship in Pagamon. Now, you can imagine what that place is like. The throne of Satan. And Christian choose to remain in the city to continue to witness you know, in the midst of this powerful satanic influence, the stronghold of the devil. And they didn't give up, and that was amazing. And that's the reason why Jesus commented about them. Indeed, uh, the word detected the beginning of Revelation, you know, 2.13, he said he, uh, he revealed Christ actually explicitly commanded about these disciples. That these disciples, instead of running away, they stay put in this religiously hostile community and continue to be a light to shine for the Lord. Explicitly, the Lord actually praised these Christians. Praise them for what? You praise them for holding fast to his name and not denying the faith. In verse 13. And they remain loyal to the Lord Jesus Christ and refuse to bow to the intense pressure under this Roman Empire to worship a living person. Not only to this Greek God, but worship the living person, the emperor. And for that reason, one of the members who was Antipas. Antipas was actually healed. Martyr because he refused to bow to the God. And he was killed for his commitment to Christ. And after killing of one of the believers, the Pergamon Christian continued to stay faithful to witness. They were unafraid of the persecution. So Jesus commanded, it's not easy to live in a culture, not live in a time where everyone is opposing and persecuting Christians, but to remain faithful, didn't denounce, didn't give up, continue to worship the Lord, even in difficult times. But then the Lord also has something to condemn, to condemn about this church because of a problem that is persisting there. Although these first century believers were actually strong in one areas and some areas, but they were terribly weak in others. And what are these areas? And Jesus here singled out two problems which expose the fact that the Pergamon believers was divided by compromise in their doctrinal belief as well as in their practices. And what was the first compromise they made? Was this Balamite heresy. I'm sure some of us heard about this name called Balaam. But where does this term called Balaamite actually comes from? Now, according to Numbers chapter 22 to 23, including 31, you want to look to. And there was this prophet by the name of Balaam. Because he was greedy, he wanted some money, you know. So he showed Balak. Because King Balaam asked, you know, this prophet, how can I defeat the Israelites? Every time we fight, we also lost, you know. Right? And Balak knew about it because God was standing behind the Israelites. So they tried many times, couldn't. So Balak came in the way. Now I know uh, how in order to defeat them, that you must defeat the faith, undermine the faith. So he taught King Balak to use my white woman to entice this woman, I will entice this Israelite man, you know, Induce them the relationship, have illegal intermarriage, and eventually leads to pagan worship. 
and Balaam's plan was successful. He actually destroyed Israel even though he was a prophet working for God. And Balaam became a prototype. People use his name. A prototype of all those corrupt teachers who taught the wrong thing, all those corrupt prophets and leaders who led the people away, let them betray the believers into fatal compromise with their worldly ideology. They added the worldly ideology and also immoralities inside as well. And Christ actually stated some, some, he stated uh, in verse 14, the sum of these members at Pergamum had succumbed, or succumbed to the deceptions of Balaam. They have followed the way of Balaam. They have taken a middle course. Instead of focusing on God, they did a detour, a middle course of compromise to let them astray from the Christian's standard and doctrine. How did you do it? In this case, it is spelled out. How do they do it? They begin with the deterations. They begin with the participation in the meals that were commonly held to honor who? Honor hidden God. Be very careful when a friend invites you to a celebration. You know that it is a meal that is being offered to pagan. You knowingly, right, and ask you to join in, in the festival. You watch out. The food that was served to this and this service was frequently the food that was left over after the pagans' sacrifice. By eating and participating in the food, the Christians who know only know that, they know it already, but they still want to do it because they are sharing in the demons' fellowship. Paul had this to say. Paul reminded us, Paul condemned the participations in pagan worship feasts. Knowingly, he says, consider people of Israel, he's talking back to this passage here in Balaam, do not those who at the sacrifice participate in the altar, not on the Lord, but to those pagan. Do I mean that the food sacrifice to an idol is anything? Of course, they have no power. Right? But the act of participating, that's a problem. And that the idols is anything? No, it is nothing. No, but the sacrifice of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to participate with demons. The food cannot kill us. It cannot destroy us. But we know that it is a fallacy, a celebration, and you participate and join in. Uh, and everyone in the month of 8 August, September, Right? There are people out there, they invite us, Pastor, I, I bought one table, come and join. I will never have a part in it because I know they have nothing to do with God. I stay away from me. Free or so, I'm not interested. Now, it's not just participating because the one step of participating leads them to the involvement in other things. Involvement in these pagan festivals make it easy for them to endow in sexual immorality with temple priestesses. Because the pagan, they worship. They have these priestess in the temple. They serve their God by participating in immoral relationship with people and come and worship. And that's what happened. And the Christians who went there got stuck inside. That's what happened. In short, some of the pagan Christians had compromised their faith by allowing themselves to mix with practice these pagan practices. Watch out from this. Jesus condemned. Beside the Balaamite heresies, there was also another problem that infected the church. It's called the Nicolaitan heresies. Now this word was found in the beginning of Revelation chapter 2, verse 15. Verse 15, huh? he talked about this Nicolaitans. You know, it strongly indicates that this Nicolaitan and this Balaam, they are somehow stick together. They're like brothers and sisters. They're like twin brothers and twin sisters. They always stick together but have something that is similar. And this heresy is closely linked. 
Indeed, you know, very often when these necklines and balms are mentioned, they always come together, meaning almost the same thing. I did a little search in the commentators, you know, about what's the difference between, you know, the balamite and the Nicolaitans, you know, and they come up with this, you know, at the beginning. Now, that's the difference. Nicolaitans, you know, are a Christian group that actually abuse their freedom in Christ by accommodating their doctrine and conduct to the society in which they're living. I mean, as they move along, they adapt with the society, and the culture, and then become one of them and adapt their practices as well. You know? And that's what the Nicolaitans are. Some of the believers in Pergamon certainly fits into this Nicolaitans group or the sect. Their moral likeness and the religious syncretism make them tragic believers of these ancient heresies. And what is this heresy? And this heresy is that the Nicolaitans were a heretic sect within the church propagating the belief that Christians could actually engage in sexual immorality without moral consequences. In other words, they say, well, since God has forgiven us, huh? I continue to sin, God will forgive me again. doesn't matter. So I continue to live the way, becoming a Christian without changing of conduct. And that's what the Nicolaitans do. They become part of society. And for this reason, Jesus strongly criticized and condemned them and named them as the Nicolaitans. Today, the current practice of the teachings of these Nicolaitans are found in today's modern church. It is happening. They twisted the doctrine of salvation by actually perpetual forgiveness that is independent of a change of behavior. In other words, you don't have to change your behavior. You can continue to live the way you are. You just accept Christ and say that He saved you. That's true enough. Your life don't have to change. You continue to live on what you're doing in the past, but say, oh, God is grace. God is love, right? He will forgive. Finally, when you stand before God, uh, because of His love, you know, uh, He redeemed. Because you say your prayer, Edema. This is what modern Nicolaitan is about. Today, the compromise of moral standard set the church. Not only set the church, I've also invaded the church. I'm sure you heard of churches ordaining LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender to become priests in the church. And this is a mockery. An outright defiant by promoting immorality. Let them continue to live the life like, you know, hey, like, you no, know, the life, you know, hey, of immorality, and yet they can say they are still serving God. Watch out for this. Today it is actually happening. Not only that, Lutheran Church, Baptist Church, you know, a liberal, you know, Pentecostal Church, it's all happening. Why? Because God is love. He accepts everyone. Yes, God is love, I agree. But don't forget that God is just. Not only God is just, but God is also holy. And God will not allow sin to perpetuate in His church. And God will certainly judge. And after laying down the conditions uh, of a compromising church, Jesus now called them to make correction, to repent. Let's look at how we can turn back to God. We need to correct our compromise. Verse 16 tells us, Repent therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you, and I will fight against them with the power of my mouth. Is there any hope for people who have drifted away from God? I say, yes, there is. God has opened the way. And the problem of the Pagan believers were not impossible for them to turn back to God. And the solution is found in this one verse itself. The first thing He called for us to do is to repent. 
Repent immediately. Repent, therefore. I mean, short of death, before we enter into hell. The only way for us not to end in that consequence is to end our affair with compromise. We must return to seeing the situation from God's perspective and begin responding according to God's teaching, His Word. His Word is called the sword. Sharp, double-edged sword. And God is going to judge each one of us. And before God judges, it says, Repent, therefore. Put another way, we must change our mind. Then we can change our will. And after changing our will, it will change our lifestyle. And that's what repentance is all about. But what? What if the person choose to keep on compromising? Then according to the word here, the scriptures is very clear. He said, otherwise, otherwise, I will soon come to you and then I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Now you notice there's a change from you to them. I will come to you and then fight against them. That This word is telling us that God is not going to wage war on the whole church. But he will only wage war and mark out those people who disobey and those people who is defiant of God and continue to live the life of compromise in the doctrine and practice. God will judge. Strong word. Otherwise, I will soon come. The time will come. He will severely judge those people who are personally involved in tolerating theological and practical compromise. And to them, the written word of God, uh, the double-edged sword of God, that practical word will become a condemnation instead of an encouragement. On one side, he encouraged. On the other side, he knows that no, it is wrong, he condemned. He's going to condemn. And the sword of God's word is for two purposes. One, it can use to amputate, cut off whatever is rotten, or a sword, right? Like can be a scapula the doctor used, right? To operate, right? To remove what is wrong in order to heal. Which one will it be in your life? Will it be an amputation or will it be going to be, you know, a scapula to heal? However, God chooses to respond to each one of us. We may be assured that He will and will not put up with Christians who defile His name either directly or indirectly or actively or passively. Jesus will deal with each one of us. And especially at the church. And after the church, you know, after judge have actually pointed out the conditions of the church and the contaminations of the church, he now called for repentance before there's a restoration. In order to be restored, there must be a repentance. Now, let's say the person repented. How does God restore the church back to him? How does restoration happen? Now, take a look at verse 17. He said, whoever has ears... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I'll give some. I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person the white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who received it. Now watch this word here. What if the person choose to repent and from his compromise and make no restitutions from his false doctrine and immoral practice and turn back to God. And when that happened, this is what Jesus would do for them. He promised them three things. Looking at this word, there are three things. First of all, he promised he will give them the spiritual food or called the hidden manna. Now, where did this manna come from? Manna was taken at the time, you know, when the Israel were wandering in the wilderness because of the rebelliousness, right? 
they were very rebellious, they were crying to God, you know, and God was gracious to them and given them manna. Manna was kind of food that people didn't know. What, what is that? Uh, manna is What is that? Uh, the word manna means what is that? But it was nutritious. And for 40 years, they've been eating, you know, huh? they didn't fall sick. Huh? It is tasteless. Huh? Healthy food are huh? tasteless food. Uh, very healthy food are not very... Uh, <laughs> very tasty food are not healthy. And this, this is the manna. Huh? It's called the bread of life. It's given to them. And Jesus says, I will give you that manna. And the manna is here, the Word of God. The Word of God is the one that gives us life, give us purpose and meaning. And God makes sure this Word will stay in our heart and it will minister to us by the Holy Spirit. God say, my Word will be with you. The living manna of God. And the second thing He promised, you know, He offered a word of forgiveness. And that is found, I will give them person a white stone. Now this imagery of this white stone actually comes from the time, right? Uh, for, it, it is a, a judicial term. Now in the ancient judicial system, you know, there is a judge and then there are jurors you know, on both sides. They will listen to the case and after listening to the case, it's not one person who decides, the jurors will now cast the stone. The white stone means the person is not guilty, acquitted, and he will drop it into the urn, uh, or a box, or whatever it is, drop the urn. One white stone, one acquitted, 50 of them to drop, uh, and they count the number of black and white. The black are those who are guilty. The white stone is the one that is acquitted. They drop it in the urn. And I counted all these persons, you know, uh, out of 50, have 49 white stones. Or 50 white stones acquitted. And Jesus is going to cast that white stone. Acquit us from all our guilt, from our past of compromise when we repent. It's a serious sin to become a Balamite and become a Necroliden. And when we repent and interpret it, God say, I will cast my white stone and acquit you from that. And the third thing Jesus will do huh, is that He will cleanse us and restore us and reform us. What happens here? Jesus promised that He will give us a new name. A new name which is written on it and only the persons who receive it see it and know it. I mean, it's going to be personal. God can be very personal to you. God will change. In the past, we are demons of, we are children of the demon. Now we are called children of God. In the past, we were unfaithful. God now called us faithful. In the past, we were dishonest and God now changed our name to honest. In the past, we were called the impurity. Now God changed us to purity. In the past, we were called the immoral. Now God calls us the moral. God calls us the righteous. When we repent and turn our back from compromise, He will begin to cleanse us he will restore us, and not only that, He will reform us. Isn't it wonderful we know a God who can do that for us? Who else can do? God called for each one of us. As we come to the end of this passage, I think it's good and important for us to keep ourselves alert and free from unhealthy compromise that is actually destroying us and drawing us away from God. And I could recall three things to help us to stay away from compromise. First one you must recognize is that compromise never occur quickly. It didn't happen overnight. And we compromise and you go. Step by step, gradually, slowly, before you realize it, you're already on the other side. Compromise is like unfaithfulness in marriage. It didn't happen suddenly and overnight. One day I'm so happy to see the step before God for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness, in health, to love, to cherish, honor, till death do us part. Huh? Two years down the road, the lawyer called me and said, you have a church member here. No, they're about to sign the letter. Pastor, could you help them? I said, what's wrong? They're here to divorce. No, they pick a promise already. They say, till death do us part. But now they say, 
Uh, we cannot last that long. So we better part now. Cannot wait until you do that. You understand? Did it happen one night? Gradually, gradually. It starts with the second glance. What do I mean by second glance? Sin always begins with the second glance. A second glance over the shoulder of sin. Instead of looking at God, second glance. As first, the second glance leads to the first fling. You start thinking about it. Eh? And the fling leads to the first touch. <sighs> so nice. The first touch leads to the first kiss. <sighs> and the kiss leads to a fatal consequence of unfaithfulness. And that's exactly what God. We have a relationship with Christ. We are married to Him. We are the bride of the groom, the King of kings, and Lord of lords. Let us not have a second glance. Stay focused in Christ, in His written word. Don't ever dilute God's word because you dilute it as the beginning step of compromise. And the second to remember is that our compromise always lower the original standard. God set the standard, and that is God's standard. But we have a tendency of lowering the standard. How do you lower the standards? Huh? I say, oh, no, you see, la, Pastor, come on, la, Pastor, let's be a little bit more up to date. La. Now it's IT time, eh? you must change. Huh? Uh, now our children, uh, I, you cannot scold them, them anymore. Cannot use the rod, you know, oh, very dangerous. You may end up in the jail. Before you go to jail, you go to the jail. Huh? Don't. Huh? No, you use the rod, huh? you will die first. But the Bible says, spare the rod, you will destroy your child. Now, I'm not saying that using the rod time to kill you. No, I said discipline is important. And Christians should not move away from what God teaches us, right? Correct. Everybody now, huh? nobody get married. Huh? I live together. Huh? Everybody doing the same standard, right? Huh? You see, everybody also, ma, right? boy and boy, girl and girl, so can, ma. what's wrong with that? You see, that violates a lower God standard. Compromise never exalt, always lower. It never, never uplift, it only debase it. It never enhance morality, it only erode morality. Dear person and sister, watch out for concessions in God's biblical standard. That standard God set, and it will always be that standard and we will be judged. There will inevitably, if you lower down, that leads to guilt and finally death. And the last thing to remind us is that compromise is often the first step toward total disobedience. Compromise is the first step toward total rebelliousness. You take the one step, it will lead to total rebelliousness. And that's what compromise do. Be very careful. Compromise is like a slippery road. Huh? I say, I don't say, uh, uh, slippery slope. Huh? I'll put it. Uh, it's like a slippery slope. As you slide down, once you start sliding down, it's so hard to stop. And it's so difficult to stop because there's this gravity pull that keeps you pulling you down. Watch out for that. But we thank God. Why? Because we have God. We have Christ who is always there to reach out a hand to grab us only when we repent. He's reaching out to grab us, but only when you repent and grab his hand, then we shall return. God wants us to repent. Repent for what? From our compromise that can stop us sliding down the slippery slope. Dear brother, do you struggle with compromise? It is good for us right now. Do you struggle with compromise with the Bible study? Do you struggle with compromise with your prayer? Do you struggle to compromise you know, your moral standard of life? Do you struggle with your compromise in your doctrinal stand? That what God has? Is your doctrine based on what God or your own personal doctrine? I know a lot of people got personal doctrine. But is it global 
and firmly grounded in God's Word? Or are you slipping down this slope right now? And getting faster and faster down the road. And if you do, there is one thing. Come before the throne of God's grace. Like the song say, come before the throne of God's grace. Repent. Turn away from a sin and claim the promise of forgiveness. Jesus said in 1 John 1, 9, if you confess, if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's come before God. Let's pray as we come before God. Oh, Heavenly Father, we are living in an intensely difficult time. And in fact, Satan, Lord, Lord uh, is having great control in our city. And it's not just talk about it, it is real. And in the international scene right now, you see what is happening uh, to the people of God. Look at what is happening in every country that is developing. And we can see all the signs of Satan's work are already there. And the church is called for such a time like this. And in each of this city, including our church, God wants us to shine brightly, not shine dimly. Why? Because we are so much like them, so much so we cannot shine anymore because we are like them. Because we are become like darkness. No longer are we light. We are not darkness. And God wants us to be a light to shine for Him. And I pray that this morning, all of us here, you know, hi, if we have any form of compound in the life, come back to God. Just like God condemned the church in Pergamon. Why? Because they compromise. And God wants us not to be like them. God wants us to be His light to shine for Him. So they will lift up for His glory on His name. Let's bow our head and pray. Oh Father, please help each one of us, every believers, right now this morning. Lord, this letter is not written just only for Pokemon to entertain them, you know, and for us to be entertained, but it's for us to hear because we are living in a time like this where compromise, Lord, has become part of our common day of life. Oh, Father, help us to stand out to shine for you. That we become our Christians, Lord, to reflect Christ and not of this world. And I pray, oh, Father, Lord, that you're empowered to do it, Lord. And I commit each one of us here, believers here this morning to him, and pray, oh, Father, that you, you be in the center of the life. You sit in the throne of the life and shine. And don't let the devil any positions in our heart in any way to control us by compromising. Because the devil is like the bear. He's hungry. Like a roaring lion. Out to devour us. And we are in no positions to compromise with him. Because he will swallow us. But we are going to be good soldiers to stand against all this compromise and not become his meal. That we become the soldier, the Lord, and shine for you. And I pray, Lord, that you be with us, guide us, Lord, for the week uh, as we meditate on God's word and make us to be a true believers in time of need. Oh, Father, we thank you and commit this time to Him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us arise as we receive the benedictions. May the Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. May the Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to each one of you. May the Lord turn His face towards you and give you peace, true peace, only found in the Lord Jesus Christ. May you go in peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Let's end with this song before we dismiss. As we go, may your spirit go before us. As we go, may we follow where you lead. May we live what we have learned, share the message we have heard, and be a light unto the world. As we go, as we go, may your spirit go before us. As we go, may we follow where you lead.